Well, good morning and uh, welcome. Um, and thank you for coming on this uh, October day of um, unusual splendor um, and spending this hour with me inside. I know that my family is do out on the lake, actually, or soon to be out of the lake. And um, I, I hope that I'll be able to make this hour pass very quickly. Um, my name is Christopher Wilde, and um, I am a faculty in the Department for Germanic Studies, currently also the Master of the Humanities Collegiate Division, which means that I uh, oversee undergraduate teaching in the college, in the humanities. Um, and I'll talk to you today a little bit about a book that um, I'm almost done writing, um, a book about um, a topic for which I'm in best Chicago fashion not trained, but I'm going to talk about in the utmost conviction. Um, and uh, that it has, and the book is about uh, Descartes and um, the tradition of spiritual exercise. And then it tries to actually, in some sense, answer a very simple question, namely um, why the meditations on first philosophy, Descartes' most important work, um, arguably, um, are titled Meditations. Um, and I'll take one stab, obviously, in the book. I take many different stabs at it, but today I'll take one stab at it. Already Descartes' contemporaries were somewhat confused by the title of his metaphysical opus magnum, The Meditationes de Prima Philosophia, in which he claims to prove the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. In his satire, Voyage to the World of Cartesius, the French Jesuit Gabriel Daniel reports that Marin Massen, Descartes' closest friend, would defend the controversial philosopher by claiming that we shall find nothing more of a Christian temper that inspires us more ravishingly with the love of God than Descartes' philosophy. Daniel mockingly agrees with this assessment and tells the following little, probably fictional anecdote to prove Descartes' enthusiasm. There is nothing more edifying than the letter that this philosopher wrote to the Sorbonne doctors in dedicating his meditations to them, which is so true that not long ago since, a friend of mine, not one to be very bright in those matters, having read by chance the letter at my house, uh, which touched him, and finding farther the title of meditations in the front of the work, he seriously entreated me to lend him that godly book to entertain his devotions during Passion Week. <laughs> the letter was proved th that proved so edifying is Descartes' dedication to the faculty of the Sorbonne, in which he claims that the meditations are designed to convert unbelievers by rational means. No wonder then that Daniel's fictional friend was touched and borrowed his spiritual book for his uh, the spiritual book for his devotions during Passion Week, when the pious renewed their faith by meditating and the Jesuits underwent an abbreviated version of Ignatius' spiritual exercises. In this regard, the anecdote proves entirely realistic. Not surprisingly, given that caricatures tend to exaggerate certain true features rather than falsify them. The devout friend may have been disappointed and duped by the main text of this allegedly spiritual book, but he certainly read the title correctly. And even Daniel's charge that Descartes was an enthusiast that is, an author who pursues a religious agenda rather than a purely philosophical and secular one, is not entirely off the mark. Leslie Beck was the first to draw our attention to Gabriel Daniel's fictional anecdote, anecdote to contextualize his own puzzlement by the word meditation. I want to join in this puzzlement and not skip over the title, but take it like Daniel's friend seriously and understand it as a problem and question that requires an examination. Nowadays, most readers, in particular the professional readers of the Meditations of First Philosophy, don't share this puzzlement. They pass over the title quickly and thereby do not take into account the generic form and function of the meditations. For them, meditating simply means concentrated reflection, but certainly not a mode of thought that in any way affects its propositional content, i.e., what it claims. They treat the meditation as little more than an ensemble of arguments subject to logical sub, uh, judgment. This mode of reading the meditation has a, as an epistemological treatise 
is informed by two prevailing views of Descartes. The first and older one, which was solidified by Enlightenment philosophy, is the image of Descartes as a founder of modern rationalist and secular philosophy. His practice of radical doubt did away with old opinions and prejudices based on custom and authority and put modern epistemology on firm footing. According to this version of Descartes, his reduction of the mind to a thinking thing paved the way for a mode of inquiry irregardless of extrinsic and pragmatic conditions, i.e., you know, how you make your argument, how you, um, the, 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 the mode of thought, rather, the, um, um, that uh, affects it. The other prevailing image of Descartes, and one that has become dominant in the last two decades, is that of a protagonist of the scientific revolution. For the proponents of this view, he represents the paradigm of the mechanistic and materialist philosopher who does away with the substantial forms and real qualities of medieval scholasticism and replaces them with empirical observation and rational explanation. In this view, the meditation on first philosophy are not much more than a preamble to his physics. While it is true that Descartes understood the meditations as a foundation of the inquiry into the material and sensory world, construing him as a scientist risks misconstruing his holistic conception of philosophy. For Descartes construed philosophy, to quote a phrase coined by Pierre Hadou, as a way of life. As he writes in the French preface to the principles of philosophy, his attempt at a philosophical textbook designed to replace the old scholastic one, the whole philosophy is like a tree. The roots are metaphysics, the trunk is physics, and the branches emerging from the trunk are all the other sciences, which may be reduced to true three principal ones, namely medicine, mechanics, and morals. By morals, I understand the highest and most perfect moral system, which presupposes a complete knowledge of the other sciences and is the ultimate level of wisdom. Now, just as it is not the roots or the trunk of a tree from which the one gathers the fruit, but only the ends of the branches, so the principal benefit of philosophy depends on those parts of it which only can be la learned last of all, namely medicine, mechanics, and morals. For Descartes, the ultimate goal and fruit of philosophy is the highest degree of wisdom which constitutes the supreme good of human life. I quote, or I quote it, it's a quote. The supreme good which is to be attained through the search for truth included as much a long life realized by medicine as happiness afforded by morals. The search for truth and the pursuit of, of the supreme good became a way of life for Descartes, motivating him, uh, him to withdraw from the world and to live almost like an early Christian recluse in solitude and to uh, observe a strict dietet dietetic regimen. In fact, Descartes uh, claimed that he had discovered the secret to a long life and that he was going to live much, much longer than um, he actually did. Philosophy in this holistic and organic sense, if we take the metaphor of the tree, was thus for Descartes a lifelong practice of transforming and cultivating his intellect. In ancient philosophy, this profound transformation of the self was known under the name conversion, epistrophe or metanoia in Greek and uh, conversio, the root for the English conversion in Latin. It should thus come as no surprise that Descartes, like other founders of religious movements or philosophical schools from Plato and Paul to Luther and Ignatius, grounded his new mode and system of thought in a conversion. Contrary to expectation, the founder of modern <laughs> rationalism and science was in good company. As Tony Crafton has shown, in the early modern, wor uh, wor uh, modern world of learned practice, I'm quoting, conversion played a vital role offering a new way of representing the path to method and knowledge. Grafton urges us to take seriously the suggestion of Merrick Casabon, someone like Gabriel Daniel, who uh, liked to write um, these satires on, contemporary, on the contemporary intellectual scene, um, that the new, f I quote again, the new philosophical sect that Descartes created owed much of its ideological force and unity to the technologies of conversion that he ingeniously secularized and applied to a system of ideas, end quote. 
And one of the things I think is also important to realize, we, we think of Cartesians just as followers of Cartesian philosophy, but in the early modern period, Cartesians was actually often understood as members, so to say, of a philosophical sect, and that's something that is important to keep in mind. Significantly, Descartes gave two different, very different accounts of the events of that momentous night of the 10th to the 11th of November, 1619, which prompted him to elect a life in the pursuit of truth. And much would be said about, can be said about the state at St. Martin's, which is a, a day of revelry in, in, the, in uh, early modern Europe, and um, you get drunk and everything, but we, won't, we don't have to go there, or I don't want to go there today. The most well-known is the rather terse account in the Discourse of the Method, which was written years after the event. There he writes that having spent some years, um, some years pursuing studies in the book of the world and trying to gain some experience, he resolved one day to undertake studies within himself to and to use all the powers of his mind in choosing the paths he should follow. He goes on to give a brief sketch of the scene of this momentous resolution. At the time I was in Germany, where I had been called by the wars that are not yet ended there, which is the Thirty Years' War, while I was returning to the army from the coronation of the emperor, the onset of winter detained me in quarters where, finding no conversation to divert me, and fortunately having no cares or passions to trouble me, I stayed um, I stayed all day shut up alone in a stove-heated room where I was completely free to converse with myself about my thoughts. In the course of this conversation with his thoughts, he resolves to reform those very thoughts and construct them upon a foundation that is all his own. As is well known, this requires him to abandon all the opinions he, he has hitherto accepted and to follow only the method he had prescribed for himself. What Descartes describes from the hindsight of the discourse is a classical philosophical conversion. The self turns his thoughts away from the world of the senses and towards itself in order to reflect on itself. Yet in the notebook he kept at the time, aptly titled Olympica, Descartes paints a very different picture of this momentous experience. That account, which has come down to us in a six-page uh, paraphrase of his biographer, Adrien Baillé, who still had access to the now lost notebook, tells of a profound and dramatic crisis and its partial resolution through divine intervention. Even more than in the discourse, it is a scene of foundation, only in the guise of a classical religious conversion. Having spent the whole day in deep thought, the discovery of the foundations of a marvelous science the famous Mirabilis Scientiae Fundamenta, sends Descartes into transports of enthusiasm and makes his overheated imagination susceptible for divine visitations. In the style of so many Judeo-Christian call narratives, mm -hmm. and you just have to think of the Old Testament where you know, one of the patriarchs is visited by an angel, um, he has three consecutive dreams in the same night which he interpreted as coming from on high. The dreams are not only sent from on high, they also stage encounters with transcendent powers, good as well as evil. Thus Descartes' dream self is tempted by evil spirits in the first dream and visited by the spirit of truth which he believes descended upon him in the second dream and opened, uh, uh, opened onto him the treasures of all sciences in the last dream. In the face of such busy spiritual traffic, it is only logical that Descartes repeatedly seeks divine assistance by praying. It may have been the lack of an answer or simply habit giving the Jesuits or orders privileged relation to the Holy Virgin, which prompted him to turn next to the bles Blessed Mother of God, laying before her his affair, which he considered the most important of his life, that's by Yeast paraphrase, and inducing her to intercede by vowing a pilgrimage to the Notre Dame of Loretto on foot, a vow he fulfills several years later during a journey to Italy. Yet Descartes' Jesuit education was formative for his conversion in more substantial ways. In his reaction to and interpretation of the three dreams, he employed spiritual techniques he knew from his time at the Jesuit College of La Fleche, where he, like other students, 
regularly underwent the spiritual Ignatian exercises. Of course, I could easily continue this list, but will instead conclude by noting again that the experience, experience detailed in the Olympica has all the trappings of a religious conversion. The duplicity of Descartes' conversion is historically grounded. Since it was from its inception, um, uh, conversion was from its inception as much a philosophical concept and phenomenon as a, it was a religious one. Um, and um, th I think that's an important thing to realize that, you know, f as I said, uh, conversion starts with in Greek philosophy is then adopted by uh, early Christianity. Um, and then um, I would uh, want to make the argument that in the early modern period it is again, again uh, adopted by philosophers. Here's not the place to trace this long bipolar history. Suffice to say that conversion's ambidexterity was alive and well in the early modern Republic of Letters. One needs to think only of another product of Jesuit education, namely the great polymath Athanasius Kirchner, who believed that he was given his scholarly vocation directly by God when he placed a copy of Herbert von Hohenburg's Thesaurus Hieroglyphicus in the young scholar's path, so much like sort of Augustine's conversion. And, um, in fact, the third dream has a similar scene in, in Descartes, so they were all sort of modeling their conversions on each other. Um, thus, conversion is a phenomenon poised between philosophy and religion, historically as well as systematically. Mm -hmm. It belongs to neither exclusively, but has a claim to both. Only by keeping in mind its vacillating nature can we thus come to an adequate understanding of Descartes' conversion. Today is not the place and time to give a full account of Descartes' conversion. It, in fact, I could easily fill two talks with a close examination of his exceedingly complex and literary dreams. And it's very clear that here, this is a young man who wanted to have an important conversion and a, a complicated conversion. And it was a very literary conversion in the sense that there were so many little details that were, um, that were you know, you can't imagine that they just simply happened. We don't know whether he wrote them down in such way or he really dreamed it in that way. Um, we, we know very little, but the point is, is it's not, um, it's, it's clearly a conversion that is supposed to do a lot of work for him in terms of um, put, setting him out on his path and found, founding um, his philosophical pursuits. Um, let me just note that all three dreams self-consciously reflect on the metaphorical logic of conversion. The first dream, for instance, stages a scene of disorientation in which Descartes' dream self gets blown about by a strong wind so that he is unable to stay upright and loses his way. In fact, at one point, the wind is so strong that it spins him on his own axle in a way turning him without reorienting him and pointing him in the right direction, a perversion instead of a conversion, so to say. Uh, just as the wind dies down and he finally finds some relief, he wakes up. The real pain that he feels makes him fear that his dream imaginings had been the work of some evil spirit who had wanted to seduce him. Even though he has stepped out of, his dre of the dream, he nevertheless stays within the topologic um, of conversion as he turns over onto his right side, for he's slept and dreamed onto his on his left side. So you can see there is also sort of the symbolics of left and right. Now that he has awoken, fear overcomes him, and he turns literally as well as figuratively to the right side. In other words, he converts. If, if we thus follow the topologic of conversion stage in this first dream, we cannot but locate the turning point here. Put simply, this is where conversion happens. The conversion happens. The second dream, which is extremely short, draws on the metaphorics of illumination, characteristic of so many conversions, as Descartes wakes from a thunderclap to see the dark room filled with sparks. Afterwards, he identifies the second dream with the cinderesis, the remorse of conscience, permitting us to identify the sparks with the scintilla anime, the inextinguishable spark of human goodness that even the fall could not destroy and that is the, ba uh, the basis for the natural light of reason, the so-called lumen naturale, which plays such a pivotal role in the Cartesian method. 
The message seems clear. What Descartes discovers by divine intervention in the second dream is that the seeds of knowledge, often used as a synonym for the scintilla anime, reside within him himself. In other words, illumination comes from within. So you can already see this is a very strange conversion because it has divine intervention, but it, what it tells him actually you need to go look into yourself to find what you're looking for. Descartes' third dream is in many ways the most conventional and citational. It stages a classical scene of bibliomancy, well known from Augustine's conversion when he heeds the injunction to pick up and read the tolelege sounding from the neighboring house and opens a random page of Paul's letters to the Romans, a scene copied by Petrarch, or more proximate to Descartes by Francis of Sa Sales or Athanasius Kirchner, whom I mentioned earlier, and there are many others that copied Augustine. In contrast to Augustinian bibliomancy, it is not scripture, but an anthology of Latin poetry that functions as a medium of divine intervention. The verse by the late antique po poem Osonius, upon which Descartes' dream self chances, asks a question dear to the aspiring philosopher's heart. Quot vitae sectabor ita? The question, which path in life should I follow, does not get answered in the dream. Rather, this question affirms that Cartesian method, the foundation of a marvelous science that Descartes had discovered earlier that day, is that answer. Playing on the literal meaning of method, derived from the Greek word methodos as the path to be followed, it is the solution to the intellectual disorientation staged in the first and articulated poetically in the last dream. Descartes' dreams thus enact and stage conversion as a pivotal event in operation in the quest for the right path in life and thought. And what you can see is, is that he plays with a sort of inherent metaphorics of conversion. In fact, one of the interesting things, and I've thought long and um, long about conversion, is, is that we don't have any concepts for conversion that are not inherently metaphorical. Conversion is a turn. If we use the metaphorics of illumination, it's a metaphorics. So, and what Descartes does here is he plays with those inherent metaphorics. He sort of enacts them and he plays them out, or acts them out, you could say. When Descartes discovered the foundations of a mar marvelous science during his intellectual crisis and then took to bed to have his three dreams sent on from high confirming his discovery, it was only the beginning of his lifelong search for truth and knowledge, not its end. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing about conversion. You know, normally we see conversion as you find the truth and that's it, but not for Descartes. Um, he had nearly laid the foundation. The edifice still remained to be constructed. Another uh, metaphor that Descartes loves using, that of an architect architecture or building. He had merely laid the foundation, I'm sorry, put differently, he hadn't found the truth, he had merely discovered the way to finding uh, truth by means of his method. The conversion that Descartes underwent in the course of that day in light was only the beginning of his pursuit of truth, mm -hmm. which was to be his sole occupation for the rest of the life. That's Descartes' words. The insights he gained in the process had to be formalized and operationalized as to bring them to bear on his pursuit of truth. So he had to make what happened to him, so to say, what occurred to him, he had to be able to control in the future. And that's what I'm trying to get at now, that um, conversion is all good and well if you can, in some sense, bring it to bear on what, you're, what it helps you supposedly find or do, or um, then um, it, it's not of much use. The illumination that he literally experienced as he woke up from his second dream showed him that the natural light of reason, that is the instrument and medium of conceiving clear and distinct ideas, as well as most other cognitive operations of Cartesian method, dwelled with him by virtue of his innate deformity, but also that it was in need of constant systematic exercise to reduce its obfuscation and increase its brilliance and scope. In a similar fashion, the illumination that pr Plato's prisoner in the allegory of the cave um, experienced when he is unbound and turns away from the shadows on the cave wall and towards the light source at the cave entrance is only the first, albeit decisive step, on a long, arduous journey towards light and truth. The climb which Plato, al uh, Plato's allegory details and which served as one of the primary models for the topos of the meditative ascent begins 
with a conversion and culminates in what later will be turned a beatific vision, an ecstatic vision of truth or the divine. If the self wants to reach wisdom, it must remain turned and continue on its path. Hence, Socrates defines, uh, defines philosophical education, which the allegory of the cave is supposed to illustrate, as a techne tes periagogeis, in English, the art of turning around. So this is how uh, Socrates defines philosophy as the art of turning around. Um, this art is concerned with the way in which the power of vision can most easily and efficiently be turned around, not an art of producing sight in it. Rather, this art takes as given that sight is there, but not rightly turned, nor looking at what it ought to look at and accomplishes this object. Therefore, the other virtues of the soul, as they are called, are probably somewhat close to those of the body, for they are really not there beforehand and are later produced by habits and exercises. While the virtue of exercising prudence is more than anything somehow more divine, it seems. It never loses its power, but according to the way it is turned, it becomes useful or hel and helpful or again useless and harmful. Rather than understanding the soul as a passive receptacle into which knowledge is poured, the art of turning around is concerned with how the soul exercises and utilizes its innate given faculties. This pragmatic bent, i.e. pragmatic in the sense because it's not just simply about making true or false statements, but how um, one you sort of how one thinks, not just simply what one thinks. This pragmatic bent of Socrates' concept of philosophical education sets it apart from competing conceptions, like those of the sophists. If philosophical education was merely concerned with communicating information, the self would be enlightened once it had received that very information. But intellectual enlightenment is not simply a question of having a certain knowledge or not, but being and remaining turned towards the light. For the allegory of the cave details a number of obstacles that prevent the soul from staying turned and reaching the source of light. For instance, the pain of relinquishing its sedentary position, the blindness resulting from looking directly into unaccustomed light, the steepness of the ascent, social pressure, and of course, the resistance to changing ingrained habits. Another of Socrates' allegories of the philosophical ascent, the myth of the soul chariot in the Phaedrus, elaborates a series of other factors that continually threaten to thwart the self's turn towards the divine. Socrates begins, let us then liken the soul to the natural union of a team of winged horses and their charioteer. Uh, with this chariot, the soul seeks to return to this divine origin and the, su the super celestial region from which it emanated. But the soul's chariot's return is imper imperiled as only one of its horses is beautiful and good, while the other is the opposite. Therefore, the horses pull in different directions, the good horse up uh, towards truth and being, and the bad horse down towards the world of matter and becoming, so that, and becoming so that the chariot driving, as Socrates stresses, is inevitably a painfully difficult business. It is thus the innate disobedience and heaviness of the bad horse that prevents the charioteer from completing his conversion and returning to the divine. In the Christian context, it is man's fallenness that is responsible for his propensity to relapse, or better, to be perverted again. In fact, in a fallen world, there's really no end to conversion until the peril of perversion ends with man's death and redemption. The circumstances that threaten the permanence of a conversion are, of course, myriad and essentially depend how the latter, i.e. conversion, is conceived. So, for instance, if conversion involves the withdrawal from family and community, social relations exert a pull that is difficult to resist as an example of many de desert fathers show. Considered as a psychological phenomenon, conversion's persistence is imperiled by, for instance, distraction and forgetfulness. If the primary objective of monastic meditation and prayer is the constant memory of God, i.e. thinking of God at every moment of your life, then the mind's attention must not turn towards other thoughts and things or its continual recall will fail. 
In epistemological as well as spiritual terms, the, per the perceptual insistence and self-evidence of the sensory world commands an irresistible attraction and thus hinders the mind attending to the intelligible or spiritual realm. So that's why, of course, lots of desert fathers, but also many of my poems that I work in the 17th century, are constantly telling us how vain the world is, how it's not going to last, and how truth does not reside there. Because, of course, our experience, our everyday experience is otherwise. That's what's most palpable and feels most real. Um, therefore, meditations, um, therefore, as I uh, indicate, meditations on the vanity of the world from ancient Stoicism onward exhort the self to avert its eyes and turn towards the noumenal world. To put it simply, conversions don't happen once and for all. They only become permanent by being rendered permanent, by continually being repeated and operationalized, what I call operationalized. If we can compare conversion to creation, it functions much like the Cartesian creatio continua, according to which God's creative hand does not rest after completing uh, the world, since it would fall back into nothingness if his hand couldn't, wouldn't continually hold it in, its, in, in existence. Similarly, conversion must be constantly renewed so that the self stays turned. If constancy, um, or constancia, and that's the term that one could maybe use to describe this, indeed functions like a kind of creatia continua, then the distinction between converg uh, conversion and constancy is more heuristic than real. For constancy is also a turning, just a smaller quintidian one and thus less dramatic, but a turning nevertheless. An art of turning thus consists in opera uh, operationalizing the turn of being able to repeat and execute it in a controlled fashion so as to keep on track in the pursuit of truth. Given that Socrates coins this phrase in order to describe the nature of philosophical education, the opera operationalization of conversion also includes its communication to others. Put succinctly, Plato's art of turning around is not only about making the initial conversion iterable within the self's lifespan, but also concerns its transmission and replication to others. In this respect, constancy manifests itself as the reproduction of the conversive experience of one self in another, and thereby serves as the basis of the foundation of philosophical schools and religious movement. We can both look at the Jesuits, where the spiritual exercises are built on Ignatius' conversion, or we look at uh, Lutheran spirituality and Bible and the practice of Bible reading and looking at Luther's own so-called tower experience where it all came to him how to read Romans 1.17. Um, and the examples, there are many, many examples. We can also go to uh, ancient philosophy and look at the conversions that ancient philosophers had and how they, in some sense, um, uh, prefigured or formed um, then central tenets of their particular philosophical, uh, philosophical system. Um, the philosophical and religious tradition of the West before Descartes developed and deployed three principal means to keep the converted self turned as well as to turn the unconverted. Rarely is one deployed in its isolation, and usually all three are combined to complement and reinforce each other. The most, the most familiar and culturally formative means to render the conversion, conversive turn permanent is institu institutionalization. Um, philosophical schools and religious movements often sought to replicate or at least approximate the conversion uh, experience of his founder. Um, Socrates remarked that the virtues of the soul are somewhat close to those of the body because they are produced by habits and exercises, evidences the pivotal role of practice for the philosophy as an art of turning around. In antiquity, philosophy is not, even, is not only learned by practice, it is conceived as practice. And the third rail consists in the material support for this institutionalization and the practices of a conversive term. A whole array of media help communicate conversion as well as help the converse, uh, converted stay around, uh, stay turned, I'm sorry. Uh, and we could, uh, and the examples of course are many. I just have to, um, I just, I'll point again to Augustine 
and um, his conversion by the book, but that was just one of the many media that you find um, in the uh, eighth book of the Confessions. And so um, that um, is sort of what I have now just called the third rail. Descartes was famously distrustful of traditional institutions and media of knowledge and piety. In the first part of the discourse uh, on the method, which gives a detailed account of his intellectual trajectory, Descartes catalogues and critiques all the traditional disciplines he had been exposed to, to during his studies at La Fleche. He relates how he exchanged the world of books with the great book of the world, only, um, only um, once he recognized that the schools and universities could not provide what he was seeking. His perusal of the book of the world, or put less poetically, his travels led him to the inside not, uh, not to believe too firmly anything of which he had persuaded only by example and custom and ultimately back to himself. He summarizes, thus I gradually freed myself from many errors which may obscure our natural light and make us less capable of heeding reason. So here you can see the, the natural light pops up again. Traditional institutions and media of knowledge thus obfuscate the natural light of reason. The problem is that the mediation of knowledge by others compromises what it mediates as Descartes observes at the end of the discourse. No one conceives something so well and make as its own when he learns it from someone else as when he discovers it himself. Descartes' primal scene of self-discovery was, of course, his conversion. The insistence on self-discovery was furthermore one of the reasons he withdrew from the intellectual circles in France and practiced his method in the solitude of his self-imposed Dutch exile. Descartes was well aware of the problem of teaching others his intellectual program. For if his method is a mode of mental self-discovery and direction, then the question immediately arises how to teach without violating its essence. Put succinctly, how does one direct to self-direct without violating the self-direction, the principle of self-direction? The short answer is practice. Instead of relying on traditional institutions and media of learning, Descartes' solution to the operational operationalization of the illumination he experienced during his conversion was to resort to practice and devise an art of thinking, as Antoine Arnaud would later call it. An art in the sense of the Greek techne and in the sense that Plato understands philosophy as a techne tes pere aguges, and, and frequently compares it to various crafts such as medicine, piloting a ship, carpentry, weaving, pottery, horsemanship, etc. Descartes' craft of thought is most commonly identified with his method and has thus not escaped scholarly notice, although most people don't think about it in terms of a craft and look at the metaphorics that also Descartes uses. So he also talks about it. It's really like a craftsman, what I'm doing here, just on the in, in the realm of the intellect. What has not received sufficient attention is the central role that spiritual practices, philosophy, and religious devotion play in the Cartesian craft of thought. More importantly, it is often overlooked that Descartes did not teach his method until the Meditations. He purposely titled the discourse not Treatise on the Method because he wanted to signal that it was a preface or a notice on method in which he did not intend, I quote, to teach the method but only to discuss it, as he writes in a letter to Mersenne. And we like to overlook that, overlook that. It is the meditation that teach the Cartesian art of turning. They return to Descartes' conversion and illumination, not to retell it, like the discourse, which is written, by the way, in a third person past tense, the meditations in first person in the present tense, but quite literally to reenact it. Thus, Descartes begins his meditations. And I just gave you the first line of the meditation because the English translation um, scrambles the syntax, the word order, and it's, as you will see, is very important. Some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I accepted as true in my childhood and by the highly doubtful <laughs> nature of the whole edifice that I had subsequently based on them. I realized that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything and start again right from the foundations. 
if I wanted to establish anything at all in the sciences that was stable and likely to last. But the task I, look, I uh, looked, an enormous one, and I began to wait until I sh should reach a more mature, a mature enough age to ensure that no sus subsequent time of life would be more suitable for tackling such inquiries. This led me to put the project off for so long that I would, not, uh, would now be to blame if by pondering over it any further I wasted the time still left for carrying it out. So today I have expressly rid my mind of all worries and arranged myself a clear stretch of time. I'm here quite alone and at last I will devote myself sincerely and without reservations to the general demolition of my opinions. So this is the very beginning of the meditations. Mm -hmm. The medita meditations begin with a turn, or to be more precisely, with the tale of a turn that happened some years ago. And then the meditator proposes to reenact in the present, now, hodie, today. More precisely, they begin by the meditator's anima, or soul, turning, verti, Vartere is the Latin word for turning, toward, at, by attending to the realization that it held a large number of falsehoods. To be true, uh, to be true and that is therefore necessary to overturn, the Latin word is evertanda, again we have, the, we have the root of turning here, it's the turning over, its entire edifice of knowledge in order to start again right from the foundations. Both the recognition that the edifice of knowledge is unstable and needs to be demolished, as well as the de demolition itself, are figured as turns. The animat versio refers to the turning of the mind's attention to the falsity of its opinions based on sensory perception, and the eversio opinionem, the turning over of opinions, uh, to the uh, to overturning of these very opinions. Not only does Descartes figure his practice of doubt itself as a turn, but it facilitates another turn, an aversion, so to say, a turn away from the sense of the sensory world. And one of the things that is also important to realize is that conversion always thinks of the things that we turn towards, but it always also implies of turning away from something. And this is what we're seeing in the first meditation and the radical doubt doing. As Descartes highlights in the synopsis prefacing the meditation, his extensive doubt is not an, uh, an end in itself, it is a means to an end, and thus useful. Another thing that often philosophers overlook because they think of it in terms of a skeptical debate. Um, but Descartes didn't want to, he wasn't a skeptic, he wasn't interested in skeptic. He was really interested in harnessing the doubt to do something with it. And he writes, its greatest benefit lies in freeing us from all preconceived opinions and providing the easiest route by which the mind can be led away from the senses. And you can already see the metaphorics of orientation and guidance here. Integral to Cartesian method, the practice of doubt marks out the path to be followed away from the senses. Descartes' skepticism is functional in yet another way. To Hobbes' objection that his skepticism was ancient material, Descartes replies that the E and A version of doubt prepares my reader's mind for the study of the things which are related to the intellect, and such arguments seem wholly necessary for the purpose. Doubt, thus, has the function to disentangle the mind from its engagement with the sensory world and to turn it towards itself in more generally metaphysical matters. At this point, it should come as no surprise that Descartes terms his turn of the mind towards itself, a conversion. In the preface to the reader, he writes, the human mind, when directed towards itself, um, mens humana in si conversa, does not perceive itself to be anything other than a thinking thing. Um, once the mind turns towards itself and has separated itself from the sensory world, it perceives something beyond itself, God, or in the words of Descartes' meditator, that is, when I turn my mind's eye upon myself, I understand that I'm a thing which is incomplete and dependent on another. Thus, the ultimate destination of Descartes' conversive turn is the clear and distinct cognition of God. And certainly, as long as I think uh, only of God and turn my whole attention to him, totus que in eo me converto, I can find no cause of error or falsity. 
But I, when I turn back to myself as a reversion, so to say, and he uses that term, I know now, I know by experience that I'm prone to countless errors. At the beginning of the fourth meditation, Descartes' meditator refused the path that she or he has taken. During these past few days, I've accustomed myself to leading my mind away from the senses and I've taken careful note, animat verti, of the fact that there is very little about corporeal things that is truly perceived, whereas much more is known about the human mind and still more about God. The result is that I now have no difficulty in turning my mind away from imaginable things and towards things which are objects of the intellect and uh, alone and are totally separate from another matter. And as you can see, the last word again is convertam, this conversion. So, um, the, uh, this itinerary from initial doubt about the reliability of the senses, and I'm almost, I'm almost done, I'm sorry for, um, that is, turns out to be a little longer than I thought it was. This itinerary from the initial doubt about, uh, about the reliability of the senses to the final illumination of the visio beatifica at the end of the third meditation, and this is also another thing that philosophers like to overlook, professional philosophers, is at the end of the third meditation, Descartes says, let's pause, now that I have proof, proven the existence of God, and engage in viewing God, so to say. And, and this is the most happy thing that could hap um, happen to anyone. Of course, with an, uh, if you see it as a philosophical argument, it makes no sense to that Descartes would just pause for a moment and say, let's engage in a vision of God, or in something like a vision of God. It's not entirely correct because he talks more about cognition, but um, I think the allusion is very clear too. Um, to the final illumination of the visio beatifica at the end of the third meditation is made up of a series of turns. Once Descartes' meditator has achieved the clear and distinct cognition of God and thus laid the foundation for reliable and philosophical scientific inquiry, he can safely turn back his, the gaze of his mind towards the sensory world. Armed with the cogito as the standard of clear and distinct cognition, and we also saw that the cogito is a, uh, is a result of a conversion, i.e., the I think, therefore, I am. Um, uh, uh, and the certain knowledge of a benevolent God who guarantees the principal reliability of sensory cognition, this return to the world is no longer figured as a revasio, but as a conversion himself. Not only Descartes' first philosophy is thus con informed by conversion, but also the subsequent scientific inquiry in into the world. Whatever Descartes' meditator does by thinking, imagining, or sensing, he turns either towards his mind in God or towards his body in the sensory world. As I've merely indicated here, um, but elaborate in detail in my book, the meditations enact a series of coordinated turns and thus articulate a Cartesian art of turning. Patterned on the meditative ascent, Descartes' meditator first follows the via purgativa, uh, uh, i.e. he purges his mind, then he then the via illuminativa, and these are classical steps within the meditative ascent, in order to arrive at the via uniti uh, unitiva, um, culminating in a vision of God at the end of the third meditation. After this divine illumination, he turns back towards the world. Put simply, by purging his mind of all confused and obscure ideas, he arrives at the clear and distinct cognition of, cogito, of the cogito and God in the light of the lumen naturale, of the natural light of reason, which serves as the foundation for the inquiry of the sensory world. Because of meditation's ability to enact the conversive turn, and something that I have really only demonstrated for Descartes here, but one could do much more generally for other thinkers and other modes, um, uh, brands of meditation, Descartes turned to the meditative genre to establish the foundations of all knowledge. The first of philosophy, remember the title, Prima Philosophia, its beginning could only be made by meditating. A beginning that Descartes made in that famous stove-heated room when he withdrew from the world and experienced a dramatic conversion. By joining Descartes' meditator in his meditation, the reader follows his return to this scene of foundation. Reconceiving the meditations on first philosophy as the principal articulation of the Cartesian art of turning throws new light on Descartes' dedication to the theological faculty of the Sorbonne. 
the dedication that prompted Danielle's fictional friend to borrow Descartes' work for his own private meditations during the Passion Week. Commonly, scholars construe the dedication as a clumsy attempt to curry favor with powerful political adversaries rather than an accurate rendition of Descartes' project and its attentions, intentions. But it seems clear that Descartes' metaphysical meditations, which is the title of the authorized French translation, are a serious attempt to establish a new genre of meditation and thereby by to articulate a rational art of turning, a technology of conversion that was not dependent on divine grace, uh, but on the practice of thought alone. Thank you so much, and I apologize for keeping it going. I think we have probably about 10 minutes for questions. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate the pressure that you put on the strictly metaphorical understanding of conversion and particularly conversion to the self. And I'm just wondering if, um, besides what you've already outlined, if in your book you go into uh, Descartes' turn towards medicine near the end of his life and a more, maybe a more literal iteration of, the of um, conversion would be precisely um, these, a concern for the care of the self and particularly like in the Foucauldian sense, mm -hmm. the hermeneutics of the self mm -hmm. as being a very um, almost physical care of the self. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if, if you can say a little more about that yeah. towards so the end um, of his life. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm not, I don't really, because it's um, been a very long journey to get here and it's already very long. Um, um, so I don't do that, but also part because it's already been done partially by others. Although I feel that um, what you're pointing to is, is that, and I think I pointed to, or I said that very clearly, that Descartes had a, a really holistic notion of philosophy, not the way that we think of philosophy in a technical sense, and, um, and that, that deals with particular questions and tries to resolve particular questions, but he really believed that philosophy made your life better. And um, so f uh, medicine was, clear, was a part of that. It was um, and and ethics and morals then um, was about the control of the passions, but because of the passions, of course, were um, because the passions were a corporeal phenomenon. It wasn't the passions weren't just some emotions, but they were they had a physical foundation. Um, that's where then medicine and morals would. Uh, um, and in his last writings on the passions of the soul, he um, you know tries to de um, develop a theory of the passion that is both sort of materials and mechanical, but also in some sense um, le um, uh, uh, leaves the freedom of controlling those passions. So um, uh, I do think one could, uh, one has to, um, you know, see this in a, in a much broader, in, in a, the point um, that what is important to me is, is that uh, whereas that aspect has been more recognized because, of course, medicine fits into the narrative of the scientific revolution and progress much better, although that branch of medicine, namely dietetics, um, which you probably just know as, you know, sort of a, 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 a mode of self-improvement and, you know, and you, of course, the word diet is it contained in it. Dietetics was actually a very serious branch of medicine. Uh, in fact, um, you know, you have to imagine that before the medical revolution in the 19th century, you could do very little as a doctor. You couldn't really intervene. So a large part of the, what the doctor did is preventing disease, and that was the domain of dietetics. Um, and, um, and so slowly our historians of science are recognizing the importance of dietetics, um, and so they are also, of course, rec uh, um, uh, uh, recognizing the importance of that for Descartes. But so you're absolutely right. It's, it's a much, much, um, we can use the Foucauldian term, care of the self. We can um, use other terms, but it's, it's um, there is clearly a, um, you know, you, uh, you know he, is, he has a comprehensive program of self-improvement. Um, and it's not only self-improvement, obviously. It's, um, you know, Cartesian method is, for everyone, and, and it was supposed to, you know, solve so many problems, um, you know, of the human condition at the time, 
Um, so he wasn't, you know, he was also in that sense, um, um, you know, there was a messianic streak, so to say. He wanted to help others with, with his philosophy. Thank you. Uh, when you talk about uh, Descartes turning to God, or when he talks about turning mm -hmm. to God, what, it, what did that mean to him? Or, you know, like how did that look if he was denouncing his opinions and things that he learned? Um, well, so, I mean, I, I mean there, so there are different ways of an, uh, answering that. It, uh, on the one hand, we can look at the argument, of course. Um, um, but on the other, what I would also, what I was trying to keep in view is, is that um, Descartes' philosophical or metaphysical meditations follow the rhythm of a traditional meditation where, um, you know, a first step is normally that the self tor turns towards the self. Now, if you look in the religious context, well, what does the self discover when it turns towards itself? Well, it discovers its own sinfulness. And when it discovers its own sinfulness, it almost, or sort of ex negativo, it negatively um, also, so to say, gets pointed towards something that is perfect. And that's exactly the move that Descartes makes. That he says, you know, actually, in fact, I can only doubt and recognize the insufficiency of my knowledge because I have an inherent notion of a perfect being who does not have these deficiencies. So, um, so as I said, we can look at it in terms of the argument, and that's what normally is done, but we can also look at it in terms of the sort of the rhythm of a traditional spiritual exercise or meditation that where, you know, someone like, you know, first, so let's take for an example Ignatius, uh, Ignatius' spiritual exercises, normally to be done in four weeks. First week is all about the sinfulness of the self, and one of the most famous um, concrete meditative exercises is his famous meditation of the hell, where he really goes through all five senses and say, smell it, hear it, see it, feel it, touch it, feel the heat, etc., etc. Um, and you're really, the self is supposed to, um, you know, experience its own sinfulness and the consequences of that sinfulness to the very fullest. And then, in the second week, we turn to, in this case, of course, first Christ um, and his redemptive work. But you can see that we have a similar rhythm, even, and um, one of the things, and, and people have noticed that, of course, is that the meditation, I'm sorry why I'm pointing over there, but um, the meditation are also to be taken in six days and have, you know, they're not supposed to, you know, Descartes says very, you know, first day do this, first meditation, second day, you know, you start rehearsing what you have done the previous day and then we go on. And so there is, you know, Descartes didn't want you to s just simply read through it. And, in, um, and in, in fact, it was a little more, even more complicated. He says, you know, some meditations have to be read through really over months. But you're not just simply reading through it as a, text from beginning to end and it's supposed to have this kind of rhythm and only will it then have the effect <coughs> because you know he as he as he said it was supposed to transform your thinking your intellect and ultimately yourself and not just simply you agreeing is it right or wrong so to say Okay. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I, I just wanted you to say a little more about what you said in answer to the previous question about the Messianic. In other words, the, really the question, to what extent was there a political dimension at all in his explicit thinking? Um, so, is that better? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, do you mean political? I mean, I, I, was, I was being a little bit um, uncircumspect by saying messianic, and all I wanted to say is I'm, I'm trying to stress a little bit that we see Cartesianism as just a philosophical, um, you know, a, 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 a particular uh, philosophy based on, um, on Descartes' system, and it was clearly not perceived that way. Um, and so... Um, you know, Descartes is not an overtly political thinker like many other uh, of his contemporaries. So, 
um, you know, if you want, to, if you're interested in sort of the political dimension, you have to sort of tease it out. Um, there is clearly a pol political dimension in the sense of that, um, you know, he intervened in, to, so to say, you could say, uh, 17th century culture wars. Um, uh, uh, you know, to a certain extent, unwittingly. To a certain extent, unwit uh, wittingly. I mean, he know he knew what he was doing to a certain extent, but of course, he couldn't always um, anticipate all the consequences. So. Um, in that sense, there is a political dimension, um, but at the same time, of course, there is also an extreme reluctance of Descartes of um, being involved into the day-to-day -day politics of this intellectual scene. So, you know, as you may know, Descartes um, uh, uh, withdrew to uh, to the Netherlands, and and had very little contact with the other luminaries intellectual luminaries of the time, and it was Mersenne with whom he co uh, um, um, corresponded and who actually distributed his text. But at the same time, there's also, you know, he was very political in the sense of that, you know, he had, he, m he was trying to win over the Jesuits, which were sort of the dominant religious intellectual force. Um, the Jesuits um, had you know, created a system of colleges all over Europe, of, uh, over Central Europe, and in some sense had a monopoly um, in the Catholic lands on med education. And he was the product of a, Jesu of a Jesuit education, so he needed to secure their favor, and he tried to do that very, very carefully. Um, and the same, of course, goes with the Sorbonne. And uh, traditionally, the way that this is read, of course, then again, is, is that this is, well, he's just, he's just overly cautious. He doesn't really mean it. Um, I think it's worth um, taking that seriously and saying, well, what if he meant it? What if he actually believed that? You know, if he writes to the Sorbonne, this is a new way of converting unbelievers. Well, maybe he's right. Maybe that's what he truly actually thought it was. I mean, because he makes a complicated argument that the Bible, you can only, the Bible can only convert unbelievers if you're already a believer that the Bible is the Word of God. So if you're not already a believer, you're stuck in this infinite regress. You're never going to. I am going to show you something where you can start from zero. There's no, I don't have to presuppose anything. Now, obviously, when I teach my undergraduates the meditation, they don't think, they, you know, they're not going out and all are converted. I mean, we, we know now the cultural and historical presuppositions of this work. But Descartes believed that he could really start, that is a tabula rasa, and by starting from, uh, by starting from scratch, there was no presupposition. He didn't, wasn't caught in this regress that you have to already believe in this text to be able to believe its message. So in that sense, um, I, I would argue, let's take this seriously for a change, and, and then suddenly it actually is not just two or three texts that have nothing to do. We have the main body of the meditations, and then we have all this front matter that people don't like to deal with. I guess one more question. We're already a little bit over time, although I think the, the, the our um, plenary address is at 11, so we would have, if there is another question. Then. Otherwise, all right. Well, thank you so much, um, and I hope you have to uh, enjoy the rest of your day.